Uh, you can open your Bibles to James, the book of James, chapter 1. Verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now with all epistles, we first have in the opening of that epistle the greeting, a declaration of who is writing and who the letter is addressed to. We have the name and position. James, unlike Paul, who declares himself an apostle in, I think, every epistle he's written, James here declares himself a servant of God. What a blessed position to be in. The true believer never wants to move above this position. Psalm 84 says, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. How much greater is it to be a servant in the house of the living God, a doorkeeper at that, not a position of very high esteem, but a doorkeeper in the Lord's house, well, that's greater than all this world has to offer. It's greater than any mansion you could find on this earth. In the story of the prodigal son, the one son squandered his inheritance, and he was reducing, reduced to eating the husks that the swine did eat. He actually had to ask to eat the husks. He couldn't just take them. That's how low he had fallen. And he said that the hired servants in his father's house well, they had bread enough, and they had bread to spare. They didn't just have exactly what they needed. They had extra. And he said to himself he would go to his father. He would say he was no longer worthy to be called a son, but would ask him, make me a hired servant. But the father put the best robes on his son, slew the fatted calf, was joyful at his return. But this is often how the believer feels. I'm not worthy to be a son. Oh, just make me a servant, a servant in your house. The believer is that servant that we read of in Exodus. Exodus 21, 1 through 6, you can turn there if you'd like. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her master's and he shall go out by himself. And if the sh servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. This is what has been given to us, the Lord's people. We love our master. And we want to serve him forever, continually. And we look for that day when we can serve him perfectly. This is every believer's position, a servant of God, one who follows Christ with no desire to go above it. Just keep me a servant. Next in the verse 1 of our text, it see, we see the 
who the letter is written to. It tells the 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. They came from the 12 sons of Jacob. They are called Israel. The nation Israel is called Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. A name which means he will rule as God. And as it says in that uh, scripture in Genesis, for as, for as a prince, prince hast thou power with God and with men. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one that has power with God and men. And the 12 tribes are a picture, the 12 sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel, are a picture of all the Lord's elect children, both born and adopted into the house of God. The Lord's people, these 12 tribes, have been scattered all over this earth. In Deuteronomy it says, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. The Lord's the one that spreads his people across the world, and they are a remnant of a remnant, remnant among the heathen. But wherever the child of God is in this world, it is wherever the Lord has put him. He's the one that did the scattering. And he did so because he has a people out of every nation. In Revelations, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The words that we read in this epistle, therefore, this letter written by James as he was moved by the Holy Spirit, these words are written to every believer, written to every elect child of God through time, not to the world, but to every servant of the Lord. In verse 2 of our text, James 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy, when ye fall into diverse temptations. He says, my brethren. He addresses the Lord's people as an equal among them, as he is an equal among them. Not one who commands out of authority, but a member of the same body of Christ. One who seeks, speaks from the same experience that every believer has. He lets the people know that what he's about to say he has experienced everything that he's about to write and everything he writes to them. Isn't it easier to hear the words of someone when you know that person speaks from experience, when they've gone through what you've gone through, when they've done what they're telling you that you should do? It's not a theory to them, but it's tried and true. It's like when you're in charge at work, and if you don't know how to do what you're trying to tell people to do, which happens a lot, I think, there's not a whole lot of respect and not much attention is paid to the person that tells them to do something that they themselves can't do. But if you know exactly how it's done and you can do what you're asking that person to do, have done it, there's respect there. There's, a, there's an attentiveness then. He says, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. We are to be joyful when trials and temptations arise. Why? How? In Romans 8, 28, I don't have to quote it because I'm sure you know it, but I'm going to. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to purpose. Whatever the trial is, it has been purposed. And the Lord tells us he's working it for your good. There's a reason to be joyful in that. There's purpose to it. Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The temptations and trials we experience in this life, whatever suffering the Lord has sent to his people, not only is it for our good, 
for a purpose, but it is but for a moment. And what is that moment of suffering when it is compared to eternity? To the eternal glory and presence with the Lord. We can be joyful during these trials because the Lord has provided a way of escape. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye might be able to bear it. That's not to say that we bear it ourselves and that this is an earthly escape that we have. The way we bear it is in the way of the escape that the Lord has provided. And that way of escape is Christ our Lord. Whatever trial the Lord has put us in, we can flee to Christ the Redeemer for comfort. Because our Lord knows our temptations. He knows our trials. He knows our sufferings. He's experienced them in his own body. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. And for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whatever trial the Lord has put us in, whatever the suffering is, whatever the temptation we can flee to the one who controls it all. We can flee to the one that knows our frame. Flee to the one that knows our temptations. Flee to him that has been tempted as we are. And we can do it boldly. With a hopeful expectation to receive mercy and grace. To help us in those times of trials and temptations. Verse 3 of our text. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Most believers know this. If you don't, you should. Your faith will be tried in this life. There's no way around it. It is a fact that is going to happen. And it's going to happen all the days that we are in this earth. It's going to be tried, your faith, to prove them that are of God, to prove that it is true faith. When the seed of the gospel is sown, some of the seed falls on stony ground, but that faith is not true faith, and it withers in times of distress. Luke 8, the parable of the Stony soil says, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. When faith is tried, if it's not true, if it's a false profession, it's going to fall away eventually. But likewise, some of that seed sown to believe on the Lord, that true faith falls on good ground. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and a good heart, having heard the word, keep and bring forth fruit with patience. If that faith that is true faith is tried, it will continue in that faith. It will continue to believe the Lord. All true faith comes from Christ. If that faith falls away, it's not that the Lord did not provide that person a way of escape. It's proving that the faith was false. It was not his faith. It was not faith that he gave. 
For in 1 John it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. The trial of faith is to make manifest that which God has given, and that which is a false claim. If it falls away, it's not true faith. If it continues, that's God-given faith. The trial of our faith is a precious thing because it proves the Lord's people. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith is precious because it works patience in the believer. Patience, which means the cheerful or hopeful endurance. And not only but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. The more tribulation the Lord's child goes through, the more temptations the more the Lord brings him through that, the more that faith is tried, the more patience it's going to work. That patience is patience to wait on the Lord. More patience is more experience. Experience of his mercies, of his grace, to be your comfort in times of temptations and trials. And the more experience is worked, the more hope. Hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not a hope, meaning a wish that we often use it today, but a hopeful expectation of mercy and grace. How can we know if the faith that we say we have is true faith? Well, if you believe until the end, if you believe through every temptation, trial, and tribulation that the Lord sends, that's true faith, believing to the end. If that seems to be a concern, how do I know if I'll believe to the end? I would say, if you, do you believe right now? If you believe right now, then keep believing right now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about right now. And ask the Lord to keep you believing, trusting that he is able to do so. Verse 4 of James chapter 1. But let patience have perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let patience have her perfect work means the completion of the work, the completion of continuing to the end in patience, continuing to the end in hope. It says in James 5, you can turn over there, it's just a couple pages, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The return of the Lord is drawing closer every day. And the world's still here because he is enduring it. The Lord himself is enduring it. He's patient, much long-suffering, because he's not willing for any of his elect to perish. Therefore, you be patient. Wait on him. Wait on his return, or wait for him to call you home. Hebrews 12 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Run this race, this life, with patience, continuing to the very end, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ the whole time. He's the author of your faith. He's the finisher of your faith. He is the beginning of your faith, and he is the end of your faith. That means he will bring all his people, all those that he has given true faith, all the way to the end. He will preserve his saints. This means that patience is something we're going to need this entire life. Throughout this life, our faith is going to be tried again and again and again. And we will need that patience that can only come from the God of patience. Patience to endure whatever the trial has sent us with cheerful and hopeful endurance. Don't worry about believing a year from now or believing a month from now. Don't worry about believing tomorrow. Just worry about believing right now. And just keep believing right now. If you trust the Lord in truth, if it is the faith he gave, he will bring it to the end, to completion. He will finish the work. It says that ye may be perfect, our text says that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If that faith is tried to the end, if that faith that you have proves true to the end, it is proof that God has kept us. Kept us to the end of our life when we shall be made perfect in his likeness. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. After we've suffered for just a little while, and this life is but for a little while. It's a vapor. Here for a second and gone the next. After that suffering, he will make you perfect. Perfect, established and settled in Christ. Entirely whole and perfectly holy. It says wanting for nothing. All things are ours in Christ Jesus. If you have all things in Christ Jesus, is there anything else you want? If you have Christ, if you have Christ himself, I, I, does anything, anything at all compare? Christ is all. Our life in this world will be full of tribulation, but we're told our Lord has overcome the world. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We will have tribulation, but the Lord has already earned the victory. What do we have to worry over? Continue in the faith to the end. Those that do, they will come out of the tribulation of this life. Turn with me over to Revelation 7. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And, once came they, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Continuing to the end, where our robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb, covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself, 
a servant of God, serving him day and night. You'll be one that serves the Lord day and night, and you'll be doing it in perfect holiness and perfect righteousness. Perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Do you want anything else? If you do, I fear that this faith is not God-given faith. But if this is all your want, if Christ is all your hope, if he's all your desire, continue to the end believing him, and he will prove that faith day by day, keeping you, preserving you, as he will for all his people. There was a reason I wanted that to be first, because... I'm done. That was a short message. Greg?